guys. Enjoy. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody, to another Telling Telegraph Twitter space. My name is Michael Tabone. I'm a senior economist at Cointelegraph Research. And today, for the next hour, we'll be discussing Web3. The blockchain industry is generally broken down into five sectors, DeFi, CeFi, infrastructure, NFTs, and Web3. And I'm sure we all remember DeFi summer. And until the, you know, the second quarter of like 2022, DeFi was the sector that was king. But that all shifted to Web3. So what exactly does Web3 mean? And what implications does that mean for the blockchain industry? And so I'm hosting, and I would like to introduce my other co-host, Mark Mason, who's the head of business development at Cointelegraph Research. How you doing, Mark? Very well, thank you. Awesome. So Mark's here in case uh, Twitter uh, decides to rug me. And we all know, if you've ever been on a Twitter space, that is a constant risk. And even though I'm sitting in the same spot, not moving at all. I uh, love Twitter. So we have the panel discussion today. The Cointelegraph Research Team would like to express our gratitude to everyone who contributed to the creation of the Web3 report and to the official research partners for their support in making this publication possible. These partners include Project 12, Veris, Exco, Pinata, Pritosium, Ventures, Sub, su- Sum, Sub, Arculus, CoinShift, Seal Storage, and Hedera. Today, We are joined by official research partner, guest speakers, who contributed to the Web3 report, including we got Elaine Song from HBAR Foundation. She's the vice president of strategy for the HBAR Foundation and with growth arm of the Hedera Network. HBAR Foundation is dedicated to providing entrepreneurs with the funding and, and ecosystem support needed to quickly build and deploy new applications on the Hedera Hashgraph Network. Brady Gentile, am I saying that correctly? Uh, Brady, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, from Swirls Labs, Director, Marketing, Web3 Ecosystems. And Swirls Labs provides development and support for the Hedera network and will be building open source components that enable faster deployment of industry solutions. You got Adam Lowe, Arculus. He's the Chief Product and Innovation Officer at Arculus. And Arculus brings superior cold storage security solutions for all your cryptocurrency needs. Their portfolio includes cold storage hardware wallets and a one-step, one-stop shop app that securely manages keys, purchases, exchanges, and the sending and receiving of cryptocurrencies. Yeah, Yana M. Abramova. Yana, am I close? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can see yeah, yeah. That awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, of <laughs> of Protosium Ventures, a manage, she's the managing partner. Uh, 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 Protosium is a London-based venture capital firm investing. Am I saying that wrong? Well, kind of. It's a pretty awesome. So it sounds pretty awesome. But pretty it's awesome. Yeah. Ah, pretty awesome. Ventures is a London-based venture capital firm investing in seed and Series A companies related to AI, fintech, and more primarily focusing on the European business-to-business market, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, Investing all around Europe and co-investing with partners in the United States with the usual focus on investments that take place in seed and first round. We have Sal Malik from Seal Storage. He's a senior sales engineer uh, engineer at Seal Storage Technology. Uh, Seal Storage is a carbon-neutral, decentralized cloud storage built on Web 3.0. Seal is an ESG friendly data storage leader in the Protocol Labs Filecoin ecosystem and led by experts in decentralized cloud storage infrastructure and blockchain. We also have Michael. There we go. Tauningi. Is that correct, Mike? Are you on with us? Of Veris. He's the lead developer. And Veris is I, scale. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I sent him an invite, but he hasn't joined yet. He hasn't joined yet? Okay, no problem. Veris is scalable public infrastructure for the world. Public blockchains as a service is to it, deploy customizable, scalable, and interoperable blockchains within minutes. No need to provision additional resources, Veris ID, digital identities, assets, and namespaces for any project. It's very, very interesting. We're going to talk, I'm sure, about that those topics. Kelly Kim is from uh, Pinata, developer evangelist, which might be my favorite title. Um, developer evangelist pinata is the leading media management company for the builders and creators of all kinds in web3 
powering the top metaverses, marketplaces, dApps, NFTs, collections, websites, music in Web3. So I'd like to say thank you very much for joining this panel today. And I'd like to just open up the questions for the public at the end of the panelist discussion. If anybody wants to hang around, we can talk afterward. Um, but we will begin by asking our guest speakers about the web, what Web3 means to them in various ways and how they see their forms moving forward in the future. So we did a report on, on Web3 recently where, well, again, all of our partners joined in. And, you know, to simply state it, and this is, this is going to be very, this is a very nuanced answer, but this is a very simple answer here. Web 1 showed your data. Web 2 allocated, allowed you to interact with that data. And then Web 3 allows you to control or own your own data. And that's as simple as we can break it down. Of course, we can get into the weeds here. But uh, my first question is for, well, I'm going to go there. So let's go with Arculus first. Um, how can Web3 users keep their assets safe with Arculus is my first question in the Web3 world. Sure. So Arculus, uh, as you described in your intro, you know, is a, a leading provider of key storage uh, in a way that's interactive and usable for anyone. So for people just getting in the Web3 space, you know, as was mentioned, you finally get to own your own data. You finally get to use your data in a way where it comes from you and you can decide how it's monetized. And one of the really important things about doing that is keeping it safe and secure. So to do that, you need to do it uh, with your private keys. And that is what Arculus does. So it generates and stores your private keys on what's uh, essentially a credit card. It's the same size as a credit card. It has the type of chip that's in a secure you know, chip-based credit card, except on steroids. Uh, and what we do is we generate store and allow you to utilize your private keys for Web3 interactions. So whether it's an ETH chain or friends at Hedera or, or your chain of choice, you know you can uh, connect in via Wallet Connect or you know, your other favorite connection platform, sign with your keys securely on this card-based system, and then interact with the Web3 space. Excellent. Has Arculus had an increase in interest from users wanting to remove funds from the crypto exchanges um, as from the, in the past, in the recent past, for obvious reasons, um, or or any Web three wallets due to the recent events? How simple is it to actually set up an Arculus wallet? Sure. So yeah, Arculus has seen, as you can imagine, a strong increase in interest given the macro pressures and and things in the current media. Without belaboring the point. Uh, yeah, and part of the reason we've seen so much interest is it's you know incredibly uh, easy and ability to use. So when you set up your wallet, uh, we like to say it's tap to transact, and that really all is all it is. So people are used to tapping a credit card at point of sale. Here you can tap your card to your phone, set up a PIN that's stored on your Arculus card, uh, enroll with your biometric associated with your mobile device, and you're ready to go. So you'll get that, you'll get your seed phrase for recovery. And from there, it's just that easy to use. If I want to send my crypto of choice from me to you, I'll use 3FA. So something I have, which is my Arculus card, something I know, which is my PIN, and something I am, which is my biometric. And within a few seconds, I can securely log into the app, securely sign that transaction, and send my crypto of choice from me to you. And since we are in a Web3 platform, whether I'm sending it from address to address or I securely sign into my favorite DAP of choice and then interact with the assets on there, it's exactly the same thing. So it's your private keys on a highly secure piece of hardware in an incredibly easy platform to use. So we wanted to bring you know, cold storage and self-custody to the masses because the current hardware solutions out there, while they're secure to varying degrees, are impossible to use for the average person. And that's what we strove to solve. Also, we have a lot of B2B partners, and being that it's a smart card, we can also put things like payment. So, you know, we want to bring as many people into Web3 as possible. So by adding things like Visa and MasterCard, et cetera, we can kind of bridge that gap, bring more people into the space, and allow people to transition from, you know, Web2 to Web2.5, like many people say, into Web3. Excellent. And so because we, we haven't, uh, I haven't touched on what Web 2.2 and a half is, 
Can you give a little what is the what is the stepping what do you think the stepping stone is between two and a half to, to three? Is it the walking around in real life with it? Is it the point of ease of use? What is the actual uh, you know, what's stopping people from getting two point five to three? Yeah, I think that you know, there's no there's no definition for two and a half. I, I think it's a bridge or a ramp that's easily accessible to people. So coming from payments, you know, we're publicly traded, our heritage is is payments and government ID and then we took that cryptography expertise and brought it to crypto. Um, you know, here from a payments lens, that's often allowing people to interact with the traditional payments ecosystem. So whether that's a traditional bank or a traditional Visa or MasterCard that lets them spend or interact with their crypto in, in that way. And then many people move from there, see the full vision of DeFi and go full crypto native because they see all of the advantages that it brings. So from a payments perspective, that's kind of a web 2.5 is allowing people to on-ramp in a way they're comfortable in a broader ecosystem, say in gaming or other web three spaces. You know, we typically see people get to sign up or enroll without needing a true, you know, key based web three system. So you sign up with a traditional login or email and you start building up custody crypto assets. Then people get excited, understand what web three is, understand what it means to own your keys. And then the good platforms let people transition it from a, essentially a login to a true self-custody system where it's at their address instead of a login. So that's that's how a lot of platforms are having success bridging people into Web3. Excellent. I, I totally agree. Uh, Michael, I see that you've joined. Um, do you mind if I ask you straight away a question here? Uh, what is Veris ID and how does a blockchain identity help users in Web3? Yeah, actually, no, I don't mind at all to have a question. And um, thanks for acknowledging <laughs> that I actually uh, didn't have the app. I don't really install apps. I didn't have the app installed. It turned out I didn't find a way to join as a speaker until I installed the app. So um, thank you and for inviting me. So Veris ID, just to dive right into your question, is the first, and as far as I'm aware, as we're aware, are still the only um fully revocable and recoverable friendly name uh, worldwide provable blockchain address and identity that's part of the core consensus protocol in the various network and so it's full it's a fully self-sovereign identity it's permanent there's no rent as in other identity systems you know you basically um, register it through the blockchain and the blockchain miners and stakers um, earn because that costs some amount of resources through the blockchain. So there is a fee associated with it that goes to the blockchain, which are just miners and stakers. Or um, with the upgrade that uh, is just about on mainnet, we just had the uh, mainnet release candidate onto testnet today um, that's all live and bridged to ethereum you can actually um, use an identity to then uh, create a currency or a blockchain which can in fact set its own pricing and registration opportunities for registering identities itself so more than just like a a web3 identity which it can it is in fact uh, i would say the most flexible and capable Web3 identity. For example, we have a mobile, um, a fully open source, everything's open source and you know, uh, available. And there, there was no company or VC and there was no um, pre-mine or ICO or no one took coins that are not 100% fairly mined on the network. But the, the open source mobile app right now actually allows you to use your Veris ID to log in, and we do have a support for um, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0, but the better approach is just the Veris ID login, which is a simple, fully decentralized login protocol that uses um, cryptographic login with the ID. And it's not the same as, say, for example, having an Ethereum address and logging in with that because um, you could use that ID. It can be a multi-sig, and you could have that ID as your authorization for a particular service. 
You can log in without a password using a QR code from the website or a deep link. Um, and you can even do it from mobile apps that can use a deep link to the mobile app to log in. You log in effectively by selecting the ID in your wallet that you want to log in, to, in with. And once you're logged in, the website can prove or the application can prove that you are exactly the controller of that identity. And the other thing that happens as part of this login, you can prove that the service you're logging into is exactly the controller of the identity that they claim to be. And now, so it's really a very simple process. So, you know, we used to say when I was um, a development lead for uh, in, Win in Windows 95, we used to say, it has to be easy enough for my grandmother to use, you know. It's a sim simple login process. So that ID gives you that benefit. But more than that, if you're logged into, say, 500 different services or you've got, you know, three different services for social networking, some for money, some for other things, maybe your email, and you use this kind of a login, if somebody compromises your keys, you, as the self-sovereign owner of that identity, can still revoke and recover. They have no control over your ability to do that. And you don't have to go and reauthorize to any of those other services or give them a new private key or public key because they just simply use the new keys that you've plugged in place. And so Veris ID gives you a lot more than just a Web3 identity, which it also gives you. It gives you a completely self-sovereign, revocable, recoverable address on a fully decentralized, unlimited scale network that allows you to store your NFTs, your Ethereum, your Veris, your USDC, or whatever other currencies you may decide to store on that. And it gives you tools to keep your funds safe, to handle inheritance and these kinds of things. It lets you launch currencies, Kickstarter-like currencies on chain and blockchains of your own that are rent-free. It is itself rent-free. And it gives you the ability to do a new kind of simpler login for, um, for the new style of applications. And by the way, I'll just throw this in there and then I'll conclude. We really like to refer to what we think of as the future is not just Web3. Web3 is like a part of it. We call it the Internet of Value. And so we think of what we're doing as providing enablement for really creating applications on the Internet of Value. So that, I hope, is not too long of an answer. Thank you. Michael, I, I think that both of us, uh, since we're both named Michael, we have like a mind meld, and you actually answered both the questions I had for you all in once. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, but I was going to ask you, you all the things you, you said, so I think that Michael vibe helped out big time. Um, is Pin uh, Kelly Kim from Pinata? I have a couple questions for you. How does Pinata help or support builders and creators in Web3? And what kind of tools and services do you guys provide? Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, before I get started, I do want to invite my colleague, Lindsay, up. We are sort of tag teaming on this, uh, on this space. So, Lindsay, maybe if you want to request to speak, um, we can get you up here. Here we go. Lindsay's coming up now. Amazing. Excellent. Amazing. Great. Uh, so, yeah, totally. Um, great questions, Michael. Uh, before I get started with my answer, I guess I should sort of preface what Pinata believes about what exactly Web3 is. So Web3 is often, you know, referred to as the new iteration of the web which it is um, incorporating things like decentralization, blockchain, or you know, tokenization of economies. Uh, these things are all correct, but to kind of lay it down into lay layman terms, um, I see, yeah, I guess Pinata sees Web3 as fixing some of the things that was not working to this day with what we know as Web2. And so a big part of, you know, fixing or rectifying what is not going right with Web2 is supporting the people building the new iteration of the internet. Uh, at its core, 
Pinata is a Web3 multimedia distribution company. The, the leader in kind of um, catapulting our creators and developers focus on what's really important, which is how they store their data, their data, share their data, and also protect their data. So Pinata itself is based, is a pinning service for IPFS, which is the alternative to HTTPS, which is what we're all using right now. Uh, HTTPS is location-based um, servers. So when you type a URL into your uh, browser tab, that's you're basically going to the location of that particular website. What IPFS does is it uses content identifiers so that whatever you're posting, whatever content you create, that is identified by the specific content um, instead of a location. And what this does is it takes power, you know, back into your arms. You own what you create, you own what you share, and you own uh, what you want to protect and potentially uh, monetize. So uh, just to, I guess, break down Pinata's services and, um, yeah, how we, how we help the creators and developers, we help them to upload content, share con content, and token gate content. And uh, this is done through an API uh, based off the IPFS system designed with creators and builders in mind. So our products um, are easily usable for uh, beginner creators with no coding experience to more advanced builders who uh, want to customize and sort of explore the depths of this technology. Uh, so uh, we just, uh, yeah, we're releasing like new iterations of our product called submarine.me, which is a no code tooling for creators to uh, token gate their content. Uh, we also have uh, an API for people to use um, as they publish content on other mediums such as Patreon or even Medium. So they can use the Pinata Gateway to protect their content by, for example, an NFT or a certain token or um, you know, maybe an email address. So they really have uh, that, they protect their gateway into their content with their audience. Uh, Lindsay, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add on the community side of, of things. Um, I really do think you hit the nail on the head um, with that whole summary. Um, we deal with, you know, media management. So, you know, one of our um, really nice things about Pinata is um, for creators who might not really have any technical experience, we do kind of offer the ability for anyone to start creating um, on IPFS without having to worry about anything on the technical side of Web3 or IPFS right away. Um, and we have a really great knowledge base for people just getting started as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for <laughs> having such a great explanation um, and for Cointelegraph for hosting us today. Well, thank, thank you for joining and you guys are. You, I have some. You have some great guests because you guys are answering both. Oh, everyone's answering both my questions all at once. It's fantastic. Um, it's almost like you guys are reading my mind here. Uh, Seal storage. Um, if you guys, if you can come up, how does Seal protect NFT media against the risk of loss and manipulation? Hey, hello. This is uh, Sal, and super excited to be here and representing uh, Seal Storage. Um, so today we're working with a number of different partnerships with regards to NFTs and backups of those NFTs. Um, you know, we, we ran some statistics and, uh, you know, it's uh, from, from the perspective of people that are currently protecting their NFTs, um, you know, up to 70 to 80 percent uh, we find are not. So we've sort of partnered with uh, a number of different NFT providers today. Uh, Casper Networks being one of those. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we've got an automated tool. And as part of that automated tool, as you know, people and, and users buy these NFTs, there's an automatic process that happens in the background to ensure that that uh, NFT is protected onto uh, Filecoin. And as we know, Filecoin is immutable um, as a you know as a stored subsystem. So rest assured, your your data is safe. 
Excellent. Is uh, decentralized cloud storage more affordable than traditional legacy methods? Um, and can you give me some examples of how clients are using the platform now? Yeah, no, certainly, right? So we as Seal Storage, as a, a leading storage provider today on Filecoin Network, we're working with a number of different uh, collaborations with some fairly large enterprise um, t type customers in a, in a sense. So research institutes, uh, you know, just to name off a few, uh, the Atlas uh, CERN uh, project, we're working with the University of Utah, uh, UCB, just to name a few. Um, so, you know, things like immutability of, of the data is, is important for, for these customers. And, you know, when we kind of look at, uh, you know, some of, the pro some of the pain points out there today, you know, they talk about dem democratization of their data, being able to ensure that their data is available to researchers globally. Uh, so, you know, th those are some of the, you know, some of the key um, you know, attributes that uh, the, these organizations are looking for. And I think what's also important today uh, is, is egress charges. So we find with a lot of research institutes, they, you know, they produce large amounts of data, you know, petabytes worth of data and, uh, you know, storing it on some form of centralized cloud. You know, there's egress charges to budget, um, right? So we find those are cost prohibitive. So, so certainly, you know, doing our mathematics, we're about a tenth of the cost of today's, you know, uh, of a typical AWS or Google Cloud storage. Uh, so, you know, the, the affordability is, is key. So for a lot of these collaborations we're working with today, um, you know, affordability is certainly one of those things that, uh, that rank high as a, as a requirement. That's excellent. Yeah, I, I recently... Not that I, I, you know, I'm a I'm a Bitcoin and DeFi guy, so I don't usually jump into the NFT space. But I uh, went head first, I guess, into the NFT space recently. And, and the project I got involved with was uh, very um, first time user centric, and a lot of people got their NFTs, um, uh, you know, I, stolen is the wrong word because code is law. But they got their they lost their seed phrases and they lost their NFTs. And I wish they had known about Seal um, before that. So I'll you know help to. Uh, you know, tell tell that community that uh, if you're brand new to Web three and you're just uh, jumping in here, maybe maybe Seal Sword or something to give a look to. So thank you very much for your answer. And I'd like to go to um, our VC uh, partner here and Protosium Ventures, which I think I'm pronouncing that wrong again. Um, what area of Web three are you focused on, and why is this an area of interest to you? <laughs> I appreciate your try, Michael. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw an Italian thing at it, so I'm trying not to say because I want to be yeah, but it's, you know. No worries. No worries. <laughs> I'll just like, do like a one line on the Preach of Awesome because so it's in essence is a capital meets awesome or we invest in awesome founders and their precious ideas. That's why it's Preach of Awesome. Uh, well, awesome. Essence, Great. We, yes, exactly. <laughs> So in essence, we invest in the future of businesses. So it's uh, B2B and Web3 infrastructure. So what we have and what we see now from, from BC perspective, right? We have a lot of big companies trying to innovate in the space and cope with rapidly coming Web3 developments. Uh, well, established corporations want to offer their clients innovative solutions, but the regulatory and financial risks of entering new markets are often too high, right? So um, what we like to see, what we are, what we are looking at as a VC, we, we look at the product uh, of, of the company that they're trying to solve things like, well, um, just to give an example, like custodian solutions uh, for cryptocurrencies, integration of NFTs, perils around crypto privacy solutions to better maintain data as examples of technologies driven by quote unquote revolutionaries that will make it into established corporations. So let's say we are like a bridge between, uh, let's say, new technologies and, and new revolutionary ideas in the market and um, uh, like big financial institutions and enterprise clients. So we back founders and companies um, who are not only developing products and services around modern technologies, but provide real value to traditional businesses. So we seek to support um, this fast adoption of uh, novel Web3 and uh, B2B solutions through professional and managed offerings? Could it be banking and finance, retail, healthcare, and logistics? Excellent. So pretty awesome ventures. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. So pretty awesome ventures. Uh, so the third quarter of 2022 saw a huge reduction in investment from the VC 
world across the entire blockchain industry. And investors appear to be moving away from DeFi, like I said previously, into Web3. Why do you think that is? Because Web3 really has kind of become like almost a catch-all theory or a catch-all word for a lot of things like decentralized identification or metaverses and GameFi. It's all kind of there. But um, do you think that trend will continue to grow into the future? Do you think DeFi has a chance of coming back? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of big financial institutions that uh, like completely form the big, um, you know, digital assets team, right? Like Goldman Sachs, for example, Morgan Stanley. They will not back off now, right? So then they will continue to invest and they will continue to look at like a solution just to strengthen their the offering for their clients, as I mentioned before. I think, you know, in terms of the reduction of an, in investment and an investment investment pace or uh, whatever we call it, I think it's just uh, completely the same story that we've seen in 2018 or even earlier when a lot of, quote-unquote, amateur are leaving and then the, 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 the true believers sustain and, and invest in the companies for the next cycle. So I'm very much excited uh, what we, we're going to see in the next two or three years. And um, I'm looking to, to invest in more amazing and well, call it pretty awesome companies, right? Just to that can potentially solve like big, big, um, you know, big uh, financial institutions problems. Yeah. Excellent. Totally agreed. I just recently interviewed Tim Draper for Cointelegraph Research um, oh, on a panel cool. discussion. And he said that, you know, um, it's very important that uh, investors do the opposite of what their feeling is, right? So. Um, yeah. You know, most VC firms are running away from investment right true. now, and he's saying you got to run into it and find the good ones, right? The pretty awesome companies. True, um, true, true. We like we know Tim Draper. Like, I know Tim Draper quite well, and I I saw him like, just just maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, yeah, he's doing an amazing job, and he's like a true believer. Um, and you know, working at a lot of companies in this space, so I completely agree with him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's a great guy. It was a great interview. Uh, I re- I recommend everyone check it out if you can. Um, you can find that on Cointelegraph or Cointelegraph Research. We'll have something up there. Um, so thank you. I appreciate you being part of the panel. Uh, Swirls Labs. How does Swirls Labs provide support for the Hedera network in terms of Web3 functionality? Hey, thanks so much for having me on. Um, uh, appreciate it. My name is Brady. I'm a director of marketing at Swirls Labs. Swirls Labs is a... Uh, technical arm uh, and marketing arm for the uh, Hedera network. And our biggest focus is around uh, supporting the uh, developer community on Hedera, uh, people who are building applications and participating in all of the various ecosystems on our network, like the NFT ecosystem, gaming, DeFi, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, we're, we're very focused on engaging with the community, uh, both retail and developers, and supporting their ability to uh, help grow the network, not only with their own applications that are being built, but also by contributing back to the network through improvement proposals uh, for code based changes, creating standards and general collaboration uh, amongst the folks that are uh, that are participating. So incredibly encouraging of, uh, of developers and um, wanting to really grow out that community and focus on uh, your organic growth aspects of it. That's excellent. Can you give me some examples of Web3 use cases or applications working on Squirrels Labs? Yeah, and the way I like to think about it um, you know, the, the Hedera network is uh, initially formed with a governing council uh, as part of its governance structure. So instead of it being, uh, you know, tokens that are used for voting on changes, we have uh, a, a group of uh, Web3 companies, enterprises, universities, nonprofits that come together. There's up to 39 of them. And they uh, make decisions for the network, it's very akin to uh, like a DAO almost. And so as that started from the beginning, there was obviously a big focus on enterprise uh, type applications. A lot of enterprises that are um, trying to understand and learn Web3 and then figure out what ways they can use it in order to improve business processes uh, and better customer experiences. So there's that group. 
But there's also uh, another group of sort of deep Web3 innovators, developers, people who are moving very fast. They're breaking things. They're throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. And both of these are really important in our minds. Um, the innovators, you know, they're building things that look like a toy because that's how it is in any kind of emerging technology space. But underlying the monkey pictures and the sushi coins and everything is uh, an incredible amount of um, very useful technology that uh, over time we will see start to be integrated into the existing financial system that we have today, uh, various organizations, uh, communities, things that are, um, you know, you would say is more established. Um, and so it's, it's really important to have those folks. And then at the same time, it's really important to have enterprises uh, and larger organizations adopting Web3 for use cases that they can use today. Um, it sort of maybe doesn't completely transform their business, but it incorporates a small degree of decentralization into their application. And so a use case for enterprise companies that are using Hedera, uh, one of them is for supply chain. And specifically, there's a company, Avery Dennison, they're on the governing council, and they have a supply chain platform called Atma.io. And Atma.io has over 3 billion products uh, within their platform, tons of customers that are using it. And they're using uh, a service on our network called the Consensus Service. And that allows them to very quickly and inexpensively write data to the ledger um, in the data model of topics and messages being written to those topics to track all of the components in the supply chain for their customers. Their customers can go and uh, verifiably prove that uh, certain products or components of products uh, have the provenance that they claim to have. And so we see that as a really big use case. We see that being able to write data very inexpensively, very quickly, and with consensus timestamps to show and prove the time that something happened as being something that can be extrapolated upon across a lot of different, uh, different industries, different use cases, and so we're really excited about that. The, the throughput of that is incredibly high, hundreds of transactions per second. And um, we believe that's, that's going live. They've been doing a ton of testing, but going live either this year or uh, the beginning of next year. Um, and then use cases on the retail side that we're seeing um, and sort of the more innovator, Web3 focused folks um, are things like decentralized exchanges, NFT projects, uh, you know, all of these uh, things that you see that are ubiquitous to the, the Web3 that we know today. Um, so that, that's been growing out extensively. Um, you know, Elaine is on the call here, too. She's from HBAR Foundation, which is a grant giving uh, organization to help support the Hedera network as well. Um, and a lot of the work that they've been doing that I'm sure she'll speak to is around growing out, um, you know, not only the enterprise side of folks, but funding the development and growth and innovation that we're seeing on the deep web three innovator side. And, um, and so it's been growing very quickly. Excellent. Great segue into HBAR foundation. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Bradley and um, Brady. And so HBAR foundation, we'll go right into Elaine. What is the mission objective of the HBAR foundation? And how can builders or creators get involved? Sure. Um, the HMR Foundation is really built around the tenant that we think the Hedera network is one of the best options that will enable and allow for scale when it comes to, you know, crypto, Web3, um, and you have kind of like the decentralized um, organization that we think is, is really important for the future kind of growth of our society. Um, you know, our, our three major goals around that are, um, one, you know, really growing awareness um, of the Hedera ecosystem. So we partner very closely with the Squirrels Labs teams um, to support the technical and um, kind of awareness of the network. The second is to increase the adoption. This is a lot of 
um, the partnerships and the work we do with either enterprises um, like Avery Denson or um, other kind of Web3 crypto native um, builders and founders on the on the network. And the third is to really uh, focus on um, commerce on the network. And when we talk about commerce, we talk a little bit about DeFi. Um, part of you know, DeFi is definitely part of that in terms of like um, you know you know buying and selling. You know what are the what are the components of that entire workflow or user flow? Um, but it also has to do with our belief that marketplaces and communities and the ability to own and transfer value um, in whatever form that value takes is going to be integral to um, you know how our our community and how our society progresses and so our vision has been to accomplish these three goals on the Hedera network by focusing on um, several key verticals that we think both are leading the market in terms of pushing the envelope and um, trying to adopt Web3, but also where we see the most um, opportunity for disruption. So the first vertical is, and we have six verticals in total. Um, the first vertical is crypto economy. So anything that has to do with economic behavior, um, what we have found this year is that a lot of that falls um, in terms of being very crypto native and DeFi. Um, so a lot of DEXs, staking, uh, Web3 wallets, um, custodial support, things like that. Um, the second is related, um, but slightly different and, and necessitates its own dedicated focus, which is fintech and payments. So the reason why we split these out is because fintechs as organizations and, and institutions have different requirements, um, both from a regulatory, but also in terms of an actual organizational standpoint. And so we focus specifically on um, you know, disruptor banks, challenger banks, in addition to some of the more traditional banks. Um, as Brady mentioned, as part of the governing council, we have several um, major banks who are part of the council and looking to use Hedera to either build CBDCs, pseudo CBDCs, or use stable coins as a way to make their payments and their settlement more efficient. Uh, the third vertical we have is um, the metaverse. And this one more broadly actually is about how we bring Web3 to be more um, usable by broader, or kind of more usable by Web2 consumer brands. So whether it's through NFTs or digital collectibles or gaming or um, loyalty rewards programs, um, you know, we're interfacing a lot with um, consumer brands that are looking for scale, right? And so this is where we see the technical features of the network, of the Hedera network really come into play. You know, the fact that the network is enterprise grade essentially means that it's consumer grade, right? It means that, you know, companies, um, you know, who have millions of users or subscribers or whatnot will be able to use the network um, to provide efficient services that, you know, you know, are always um, up and running, right? The fourth key area is sustainable impact. So we have a specific fund devoted to um, ESG initiatives, um, you know, this is something that we think is both important from a strategic standpoint. Um, the market around carbon forwards um, has been growing incredibly in addition to the fact that as companies and organizations become more environmentally conscious, which again is, is naturally a good thing for the, for the world, um, you know, we're seeing this as a, as a major opportunity and a use case where DLT can really provide, um, provide solutions. We also have a fund on privacy and healthcare. Um, we think that this is um, an interesting use case that, again, similar to um, sustainable impact, where we actually see technical solutions that can benefit um, these industries and kind of the privacy and privacy preserving use cases. And we also have one on female founders. Again, we see that women are a rapidly growing investor class in addition to um, you know, an important demographic when it comes to building and maintaining diversity. So, you know, by focusing on all of these six areas, um, communicating and leveraging the inherent benefits of the network, we're really trying to promote and show that Web3 really is something that is um, scalable and adoptable and um, something that should be mainstream. Excellent answer. Whenever I talk about Hedera, um, I'm always very careful to explain that it's not a blockchain. 
it's a DAG, um, right? So um, it's very interesting when I go into that because people are, you know, some people just lump everything together into blockchain because it's so much easier, right? Than, you know, saying there's <laughs> there's this kind of technology, this kind of technology. Um, we even we do that too. Actually, we, we'll describe it as a blockchain in many cases, and then um, you know, it's the most ubiquitous word that's used uh in the space and then you can even interpret it as a blockchain if if you want there's um you know, the team has innovated a way to be able to interpret the hash graph as uh and transaction on as blocks um so that that helps with integrations into applications and explorers and other things that um sort of require the functionality of uh of blocks um which is which is needed. Oh, excellent. Very, very good. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's interesting stuff. Can you, I was going to ask you, you know, if you were, if you could talk a little more on, 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 on that without getting too deep into the weeds. Cause uh, you know, but um... yeah, yeah, definitely. We, so um, at the end of the day, when it comes down to the developers and the retail users and people who are actually engaging with applications that are built on the network, which runs on Hashgraph consensus, their experience doesn't change in terms of the usability aspects of it. They don't really have to think about the fact that there's Hashgraph running on, uh, you know, underlying the network. Um, but what Hashgraph does as a consensus mechanism is it's, you know, it achieves the same end result of blockchain, which is uh, consensus on transactions. But uh, it does so using a different data model. So it's a graph mm -hmm. instead of a chain of blocks. And uh, it, it does so much more efficiently than, uh, than a blockchain. And Hashgraph has a property of it called uh, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, which is like a ridiculous mouthful, uh, or ABFT. And... Um, the value of the property of ABFT is this, one of the biggest values is this concept of fair ordering of transactions. We're finding that um, because of fair ordering of transactions and consensus timestamps for each transaction, you end up with a ton of value for certain use cases um, and for security of the network that you wouldn't be able to get with a blockchain. And so what that looks like in practice is, um, you know, for example, we're a proof of stake network. So uh, in most proof of stake networks, when you stake your cryptocurrency to a node, you, um, a lot of times there's what's called bonding and slashing. And uh, that is when you have to actually give up your cryptocurrency to a node and if the node behaves in a nefarious way, uh, the people who staked and the node itself get slashed, or that's a punitive system. And the way that you could get slashed or be punished is the node behaving in a fair way, in an unfair way, like reordering transactions, trying to put one transaction ahead of another one um, for maybe some financial gain. On Hedera, because of Hashgraph, the code actually prevents node operators from being able to reorder transactions. There's no mempool. And so the code base has this built into it. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit technical as the way I'm describing it, but it's, it's one sort of use case of fair ordering that really makes uh, a huge difference in the way that the network functions and then um, sort of the experience for end users. Another thing is like consensus timestamps. So, you know, as mentioned before with uh, the Avery Dennison use case, um, the network has built in timestamps and transactions are ordered fairly based on those timestamps. Um, and so, you know, it opens up the door to uh, a whole slew of, of use cases because of fair ordering that you normally wouldn't be able to get on a blockchain network without uh, an extreme degree of configurability with smart contracts and other things to try and derive, uh, you know, accurate consensus timestamps that are verifiable. Oh, I appreciate that, Brady. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to circle back to various, if I could, uh, Michael, can you just give us a little, uh, 
um, a, a briefly um, a little bit about what Veris is from your um, vantage point? Yeah, thanks very much, Michael. Um, so you asked about Veris ID originally, and Veris ID is one of the basically features of Veris. Veris, in fact, and I, I definitely take some exception to a few of the things that were just recently said um, about blockchain networks, because we actually solved those problems. And I'm pretty sure that they haven't been solved and that not some of those are not addressed in the ordering. But Veris is an is it started as a blockchain that was included zero knowledge proofs, uh, included basically UTXO, like the Bitcoin kind of consensus model, but it is a 50% proof of work, 50% proof of stake network. And now it is, it has been testing for years and is about to release. It's on like, we are hoping to release it this year and activate in the beginning of next year. Um, it's an unlimited scale, multi-blockchain, Of currencies, um, unlimited numbers of blockchains that are all connected, uh, provable connections, not multi-sig connections the way people have been losing money on bridges in the past, provable, auditable uh, connections as we have on testnet today that you can go use, um, provable connections to Ethereum and other blockchain projects that would talk to us about how they can connect because that's quite easy to do. So really all networks and all of the networks that are connected are rent free. They can be completely fair launched and owned by the people completely decentralized or companies can actually launch these. Um, you know, for example, the bandwidth that you could get on some number of blockchains can pretty much be the number that you need for a particular application with each blockchain hitting around 150 uh, transactions per second. And, it, and so the network itself is something that hasn't existed in crypto before. It literally allows anyone to, in a decentralized permissionless manner, get a provable identity and use that identity to secure data, to handle multi-sig, to be an actual DAO or to launch a blockchain of their own with all of the capabilities that are inherent in Verus, and I should mention that includes um, decentralized finance, the ability to just with a command create a liquidity basket out of up to 10 different currencies that can be converted between each other. And if you think about what was just mentioned around you know, fair ordering and ordering of transactions, you probably are thinking about that as maybe some potential interesting value for what we call minor extracted value because as most people who have been involved in DeFi for the last year know minor extracted value is being taken and stolen from users and liquidity providers all the time every day every block on every ethereum like vm based network because transaction ordering matters and Verus is the only DeFi protocol that exists that I'm aware of or that we're aware of at all that actually has an MEV resistant protocol that simultaneously solves all transactions in a single block, regardless of order, and can solve them with up to 10 currencies in every basket where everyone converting between currencies gets exactly the same price with no spread, there's so it basically solves the MEV problem, but it's more than just doing it on a per block basis. And this would be a tricky thing if the Hedera people started to look into this and try to figure out how to solve this. It actually requires solving MEV through protocol solutions that can handle multi-block efforts. So as far as as far as we know, there has been no TradFi or DeFi technology that could allow people to actually solve front running until this solution. So our thinking, and you know, people have a lot of lofty goals about what they're trying to do for humanity. What we did is we launched this without taking money out of it. We launched it 
as a fair launch, many of us founders donated uh, the majority of our early mining and staking to make this happen. And the reason is not because we don't believe in business or people leveraging this. The reason is because no one else was actually making rent free infrastructure like the people who did the web at the beginning or the people who did the, those early things. And that's what we're doing. And when this is released, there are so many opportunities for building on top of it without worrying about does the blockchain scale? Because, you know, you can have your own, you can have multiple, they're connected. If you launch your own currencies on one, you can send those currencies to another. You don't have to worry about fair ordering being something that's going to solve MEV because the protocol is actually a much more advanced actual thought through solution for MEV that works. And you can try all of it today on the test net and help us, you know, along with everybody else in the world. And there are companies working on it. So I would say to a pretty awesome uh, venture, you know, capital group, if you um, have companies that are thinking about starting projects, they will have an easier time building real value for people if they leverage this technology. Because unlike Bitcoin comes out and then we say, let's just put a world computer on top of it. We looked at the decentralized model and designed primitives that enable applications to be built so much more easily than what people are doing today. And I'm excited to be able to actually have this available in the world for people to use on mainnet, run any kinds of currencies over really soon. Right now, people are building on the test net for this no new advanced upgrade, but that is Varus in a nutshell. And I really appreciate you giving me a chance to to uh, give it a little intro that it, that covers it. No, yeah, no problem. I uh, actually introduced you uh, and uh, and your company previously before you were able to jump on. But thank you for expanding um, on on the introduction. So I really appreciate that. And what I love about the whole thing is how much um, everyone's trying to come up with good solutions, and every there's a whole bunch of this. And as we're you know, uh, I know Dan Held keeps saying all the time. You're so early, and he's right. Like we're all so early in the space, and it's still growing, and it's really amazing. And, and that's one of the things I love about being part of Web3 um, in this whole entire thing. The evolution is the fact that we are still growing. I'd like to take a break from the panel for one second to introduce our terminal. The Cointelegraph Re Report Terminal is available at research.cointelegraph.com provides institutional grade research on blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and digital assets. The terminal offers free and premium research reports as well as a growing list of exclusive databases with up-to-date information on all areas of the crypto space, including crypto funds, venture capital, which I'm a little partial to because I write that one, security tokens, and regulation. Cointelegraph Research publishes a bespoke monthly investors insights report created for professional and institutional investors. So I really recommend everyone really check it out one more time. That's uh, research.cointelegraph.com. Please go check that out if you get a chance. I'd like to open up these questions for everybody, if I could, um, and just have a discussion. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions or myths about Web3? Any of the panel speakers want to jump in real quick? Uh, We're going to try I, I, to... I could throw one thing in real quick and then just listen to others because um, one thing I'd mentioned, though, uh, Varus is not a company, actually. Varus is just a protocol, a project in a worldwide community. And anyone in the world, company or otherwise, governments are actually working with us as well, are, you know, we're, are welcome to come and leverage the protocol uh, and understand why it actually is something about it. Anyways, what I think one of the biggest misconceptions that we find, and you might obviously know why we find this, uh, as a project, the kind of project we are, is that Web3 is somehow built on Ethereum. Because I don't think it actually has to do with any particular uh, currency or network. I think Web3 is the concept of its user owning and being self-sovereign over their own data, their own domain, their ability to transfer funds in a decentralized way and these kinds of things. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions that I've seen, even in, even in write-ups and documents, is you go and you look at it and it's the first thing you learn about is that it must be written uh, on an EVM or on a VM. And in fact, that isn't, that isn't true. 
So I would just say that that's a misconception. If people believe that it is true somehow that that must be, I'd have, be happy to have the conversation, but I just throw that out there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else with anybody else like to answer? Yeah, I, I'll chime in on that point. Please. Um, so I absolutely agree. It does not have to be ETH. I mean, that said for everybody in the space, it's certainly has the most tools available. And it's certainly, if you're new to developing or new to the space, it's, it's the easiest, one of the easiest ways to jump in. There are certainly other protocols, there are other tools, but you know, if you just Google it, I, I agree that that is the impression that is often given is that you know it's EVM or ETH keys and that's it. Uh, I do want to comment that for Web three, you know, I agree with everyone that said around identity and the root of their identity. And when I give talks around Web three, you know, people say where do you start or how does it start? And I do believe it is identity. And for us, and I believe the right way to do it is that identity starts with entropy and randomness on a secure element. Um, because if it doesn't, you know, you are storing the root of your identity, most likely in an unsafe place. So everything you build and all of those zero knowledge proofs and self-sovereign things that you acknowledge that I'm 100% behind and 100% advocating for, you're storing the root of that in a poor and insecure place. So you, know, you can add multisig, you can do lots of things, but at the end of the day, just as you would store cash or bonds or securities in a safe way, you need to be thinking about storing your digital identity, your digital assets, and your self-sovereignty in a secure way. This isn't referring to Veris ID in any way, right? I'm referring to your global digital identity regardless of protocol. Okay. Yep, just but in general. We're talking about just Web3, right? So what are the just, you know, some of the basic misconceptions and myths. Completely. It's a great place to start. I think I agree with you completely. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Brady, Kim, uh, Kelly, Lindsay, do you guys have any uh, any comments on any misconceptions about Web3? Might be out there. Anybody? Anyone on anyone the panel, really? Hey, uh, I, I can jump in. Steel storage here. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the misconceptions we certainly hear about is energy usage uh, on blockchain. Um, so, you know, a lot of the times when we think about, you know, Bitcoin, for example, there's a lot of wasteful energy in that, that process, right, where there's, you know, computational uh, that, that needs to be completed, right, in order to may, you, where you may or may not receive a reward. So that's somewhat wasteful. Uh, when we talk to storage on, on the Filecoin decentralized network, uh, first of all, you know, all the storage providers subscribe to what is known as Filecoin Green. Uh, so ensuring, for example, ourselves, CS Storage, we meet all the ESG requirements to ensure that, you know, from sustainability and energy usage, we're using, you know, natural resources in order to do that. Um, and then when we look at the process of, of actually going through and onboarding a customer onto the Filecoin network, you know, there's a process known as sealing. So we see that as, as useful energy in a sense where we're actually taking uh, that power and that energy uh, to go ahead and seal that data onto the Filecoin network, onto Web3 decentralized storage. Uh, furthermore, there's a verify um, process that takes place on the network, um, which which occurs every 24 hours um, as, as a sort of general overview to that. Uh, but again, that is energy that's being used to ensure that the data is verifiable, uh, that it's immutable, and that it's there, right? So bad actors, for example, as we sort of talk through uh, a lot of that, right, would be, um, you know, slashed accordingly. Uh, so I think, you know, that th those are the main things we hear. You know, we just want to make it, you know, clear that, uh, you know, seal storage today is fully ESG uh, compliant. And, uh, you know, from the perspective of energy usage, the Filecoin is, is not wasteful. Excellent. I totally agree with that answer. Um, what are, um, if we can go into the, you know, kind of another question, one of the main difference, differences between Web 2 and Web 3 comes down to who owns the content. We were just talking about this, right? Data and apps. Are there any dangers to Web 3 that our listeners should be aware of? You know, for example, with users taking control, owning their own data identity in Web 3, does that present new risks or attack vectors in protecting their personal data and assets? You know, as the old saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And, of course, my one of my favorite sayings, right, the code is law. You know, the, the, the thing is, you know, we are given this self-sovereignty or this ability to have control over our own data in a real way. Um, the question becomes, you know, what are some of those risks besides, you know, uh, losing uh, just your, your seed phrase? 
Um, and I know that you guys have some, some people on the panel have great solutions for those problems. Just wanted to open it up. What are some other risks that might be out there? I think, you know, being your own bank is absolutely terrifying. So if you look at sort of Web3 in the way that it is today, you go and you create your account, uh, you own the keys. If you lose them, like you said, you're, you're pretty much screwed. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a scary prospect for a lot of people. And I think the whole space is trying to sort of figure out ways that are still decentralized to allow people to uh, mitigate or lower the amount of risk that they take on with having a public and private key that um, is sort of the, the end all be all things like decentralized recovery of credentials. Um, and so, so that's a big aspect of it. And then um, the other thing too, is it's all transparent. So anything that happens on uh, the network associated with your account, that's visible to, to everyone. Um, which is, you know, one of the, the positive sides of Web3 is the amount of transparency, especially when it comes to sort of a reinvention of the financial system. A more transparent financial system is, uh, you know, what, what we're striving for. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you create an account and you, uh, you know, start performing various transactions with it, writing data, yada, yada, you, um, all of that's visible. So uh, it, it follows you. And if uh, there are aspects uh, of sort of your financial history or applications that you're interacting with or things that you're doing where you want to remain more pseudonymous, um, it, it's another risk if your, uh, your account becomes sort of doxed. So I, I think it's sort of twofold on the, on the privacy front there. It's both good and bad. So... I'd like to add to that. I think that um, that those are exactly core problems that um, you know that we have in blockchain, which is in fact why we have zero knowledge proof transactions. That was an important thing. So we um, enabled the ability to not actually have to have everything you do on the blockchain transparent. And it is exactly the reason. Instead of you know, it's not that there isn't a solution to decentralized revocation and recovery. It's that we've actually had that solution on our main net for now about three years. And it is just simply being able to um, revoke and recover whether you are a service that somebody is subscribing to where they have control of their ID, but you can have a revocation service that might watch for fraud or things like that. And so these are the scary things. If you lose your keys on Verus, in fact, we've had people lose their keys. That doesn't mean you lose your money anymore. Because if you have an ID on Verus, that can be a pseudonymous ID. And it can have zero knowledge proof endpoints that you can accept, you know, private messages and private transactions to. And you can send private transactions to and from that ID. Um, and if you have an ID and you... Uh, you know, had that ID say is storing uh, funds or maybe it's holding an NFT that you sent over from Ethereum and somebody steals your keys or you lose your keys, which I think was an example given earlier, um, then you can just resort to the revocation and recovery. And, you know, then the question is, this is a protocol. So, you know, we have ways of kind of making that relatively easy, I would say, for people to set up. But it's an entrepreneurial opportunity for people to come in and say, we're going to have this simple app because the technology is there. There might be a whole part of the industry confused about how to solve it, but it's solved. And so, and as far as being simple to write apps, you know, somebody mentioned that Ethereum would be simpler to write apps. And I actually, I'd say that's not true because you can access all of these features without programming and they're RPC commands. So if you can just do RPC commands and you know how to write normal web programs, you can now write web three programs using this. And all I would say is I just encourage people to try it because it's not vaporware or something coming in a year. It's actually something you can try today. So as far as the issues around um, risks of being your own bank, yes, that's an issue. We, the other systems, every system that's decentralized and trying to be responsible should provide a way at the lowest level to have a primitive that's an identity that allows you to 
indirect through private keys like a namespace does. And that's what we have. And that's unfortunately something that, um, you know, the closest thing I know of that you can get to in a system today is by renting a domain name and, and renting it through a decentralized service, but it's still renting a domain name. So, yeah, I, you know, I do, you know, charming and doing a lot of cryptography, both in centralized finance and decentralized finance through Arculus, centralized through our, you know, complex secure payments business. Um, you know, people are slowly getting back to that kind of cash mindset in the same way you have to protect cash. You have to protect these assets because there's, there's no one to do it for you. Um, you know, I do see people continuing to get excited about having their root identities come from them instead of going and asking a giant web company or tech company to essentially make an identity for them, thank them for it, and then get monetized by those big web companies You know, having the root of identity and their assets coming back to them. I do agree that it's a little scary uh, to people getting started, uh, regardless of the technical ways to recover identity. I, I don't... I don't want to get into that debate. I do think that for my position that any recovery mechanism needs to be deterministic and not hazy. Um, you know, here you have to make it usable because the worst security in the world or the worst platforms in the world may have a great solution, but if it's not easy and consumer proof, I think as Elaine said, then no one's going to use it. So we have to, as a group, build these things so that the average consumer can both use them, feel comfortable with them, and it needs to feel like something they're used to. And those are kind of the tenants that we used uh, as we built Arculus. So everybody can tap a credit card at a terminal, right? So we reasoned everybody could tap a card to a phone uh, and feel comfortable using their private deterministic keys that work across every known set of cryptography that I'm aware of. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts relative to, quote, being your own bank, being your own root of identity. Excellent. Yeah, Kelly, I, I saw I, you liked it. Go ahead. I'm sure go to the link. Oh, no. I was, I was just going to say, I think, you know, I have really enjoyed listening to this, this conversation. Um, you know, to answer your, your two questions, I think the most recent one on risks and, you know, the one prior to that around misconceptions, you know, I think it actually has a lot to do around, like, what the risks of Web3 and, you know, crypto and, you know, all this is. And I think, you know, in the myriad of conversations that we've at least had, and I think, um, you know, we see we see multiple different camps, right? Because the audience that we talk to is both very enterprise, very Web two, um, but also you know very crypto native, and so you know really kind of spans the spectrum of, you know, your thoughts or your familiarity or or um, exposure to Web three. But the one consistent thing, actually, the two consistent things that we found are. Um, the importance of the user experience, whether it's an end user, a, cu a consumer, a customer, or a developer, a founder. Um, so the user experience, and then kind of the constructs around how to think about and make decisions regarding risk. And I think that, you know, maybe it's the transparency, or maybe it's just because we're so deep in it, but the, the transparency around the cryptography, the code, um, the decentralized nature, just the, the general transparency around crypto in general, or that crypto enables, I think forces, you know, enterprises and individuals um, and consumers to think about risk, right? And to really even go back into like, okay, in my, in my mainstream, like web two life, or in my fiat life, what are actually the risks that have been hidden from me that I'm, you know, without understanding have already agreed to, right? Or without, um, you know, my direct consent that I've already been exposed to, right? And I think um, the fact that it's so transparent, the fact that everything is, is on chain or, you know, you can choose whether, you know, what's on chain and what's off chain. Um, it's definitely almost like an, um, like an identity crisis that larger enterprises need to go through to like understand, okay, what is it, that I need to adopt or that I want to adopt and how does this, how does this change my relationship with my consumers or my customers? Um, and so I think that's something that, you know, at least on the foundation side, we see as our biggest value, which is helping different entities and different consumers kind of walk through um, any change in mental model that they need in order to understand how to actually use Web3, 
and then to become believers in Web3. Um, so I think that's both a misconception, but also a risk, as meta as that sounds, in terms of how do you actually path people to restructure their mental models around what risks that they're actually um, comfortable with taking? Because I think you know, normally by the end of the conversation or end of you know, multiple conversations, whatever risk they thought that they were adopting at the very beginning is actually not that much riskier than um, you know, what they've already been imposing or have been imposed to. Absolutely. Totally. Understand. Yeah. Makes complete sense to me. Uh, I think those are, those are valid, very valid points. Um, I would just, I would just like to give everyone respect everyone's time. Um, I just wanted to, you know, if, if Lindsay and Kelly want to jump in, I know you guys have been uh, a little bit quiet on this part of the panel. You don't have to, I'm just uh, suggesting that way we get everyone's viewpoint. Thanks, Michael. I, I love hearing about different ideas and, um, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise. Um, I will, on behalf of Pinata, briefly migrate away from topics on uh, identity and finance in the context of Web3 and kind of uh, shift to more Web3 infrastructure from a content and media standpoint. Um, I want to start actually by talking about a real pain point for not just Web3, but I guess Pinata as a company. Um, this is a common question we receive as feedback or maybe complaints from our current users. So a lot of people ask, you know, what happens uh, to the point of respond, you know, res being responsible for your own content, your own keys, your own identity? You know, what happens when, in the context of Pinata, my content gets unpinned, say you stop using our services, et cetera. Um, a lot of people, you know, that's a fear for them. Where is my content going to go? Where is it going to live if it doesn't live with anyone? So, I mean, I think with Web3, there are always, you know, there are trade-offs. Um, we talked about wallets, you know, losing your seed phrase. We talked about the, the issue of, over transparency and being you know exposed to certain dangers but what i'm quite bullish on in terms of web3 is that i think we're missing a vital difference that web3 has against web2 and this is kind of the power of community and like sort of peer-to-peer -peer interactions so um just to i guess use a recent example uh, all the NFTs minted on FTX were not hosted on any sort of decentralized storage. They were hosted on uh, centralized services like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud. Um, now, if this was hosted on something like IPFS, say you perhaps you're using Pinata to pin the data, uh, what could happen instead of losing these NFTs and this content is if you remember back when um, I think Hick et Nun, uh, the acronym is HEN, but they suddenly, the founder suddenly announced it would be shut down. Now this was a huge marketplace. It's uh, it's built on top of the Tezos blockchain, but it, I think in the context of the NFT artist community, it was so much more. It spawned a whole level of creativity in terms of NFTs. Um, artists, collectors, investors, you name it, they were all concerned. But the good thing is that the database of HEN was stored on a storage solution like IPFS. So basically this whole community of artists, collectors, investors sprang into action. They, uh, you know, the team at uh, DNS.xyz con contacted Pinata and asked, how can we get our data back? Uh, this was nearly 2 million files of IPFS storage. So if you can imagine the worst possible thing, um, the potential of losing all your data because it was self-hosted, uh, well, because you owned it, was uh, going to get lost. You can imagine what a solution like IPFS could bring, what sort of hope that could bring back to them. So yeah, I, I'll wrap it up by saying, you know, what happens when files are not forced into like a permanent storage solution or trusted with a centralized network? It's possible that they can be lost. You know, files can be unpinned, content lost. But ultimately, because the community element of Web3 is so strong, 
and because the user experience is put at the fo- uh, put at the forefront of certain protocols and APIs, there is so much hope. You can always get it back. You can um, rescue it with the power of a collective. Um, so, yeah, I I, um, I want to say trade offs definitely, but um, to Elaine's point, there's more thought about risk management and how might we, um, you know, avoid the worst case uh, scenario. There's a power of community. And uh, yeah, there's just so many people thinking around these potential pain points that I don't think that the pain points of Web3 are as painful as those of Web2. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what, what Pinata thinks about the state of web three. <laughs> and I absolutely agree. And that's my, my favorite thing about evangelizing the blockchain industry um, and the, you know, and the web three is the fact that when I tell people, they go, but have, but have you guys thought about this? Have you guys thought about that? And I am, I always like, I'm like, I hate to break this to you, but there are, you know, uh, millions of people around the world that are, are thinking of this and have come up with a solution um, and are trying different solutions for every single one of these problems you know, that have thought about this thing way more than, than you who just, who don't even, doesn't even really know uh, the history of blockchain and all sort of kind of stuff. So yes, believe me, there are people out there working on all these solutions. So I, I, I agree. Um, and I am very excited um, every day that I get to come to work because I get to see what's actually being built. And so people ta- all the time ask me all the questions, right? They ask me, um, you know, Bitcoin's down today, you know, or, you know, what's going on? And I go, look, there's so much stuff being built and so many great people in this uh, in this community that, uh, believe me, there's going to be a very bright future ahead for, for the blockchain industry. And then we are coming up at about a 90 minute mark, I think, Michael. So if you have one more question for everybody, they can slap on their their party sure. goodbyes as, the, as well on their answer to it. Absolutely. All right. So I'll ask this one last question as a as a um, as a way out. And yes, please, um, you know, um, use this as a, a little quick uh, answer to this, and we'll move and we'll get this thing wrapped up here. Unless you've been living under a rock, you're all well aware that the internet is under attack. The internet service providers (ISPs) are threatening net neutrality. Governments are cracking down on online content. And the social media platforms are censoring users more than ever before. Is Web3 the ultimate censorship resistance catalyst? That's, that's the, the, the final question I have. And we're just going to go, I'm just going to go in order here. Um, so can I have uh, Eileen from HBAR Foundation? Yeah, that's our ending question. That's quite a, it's quite a hot one. Yeah, um, I know. I, well, I we, we were all having so much fun here. I do all the time went real by real quick. So, um, you know, keep going. Yeah, I um yes, I I I do think that um you know, web3 is a very good answer to um kind of censorship. Um I think the premise of the question is um, loaded. Um, so it's, it's hard to, um, you know, I, I feel like it's hard, it's hard for me to actually answer like the, yeah, maybe the, the question that you're, you're trying to ask, but I do think that, <laughs> <laughs> I do sorry, think that I just want, it's I'm just trying to make it a little bit controversial because I want to get a little conversation going. That's all. Yeah. Man, so I think, um, I do think that web three is, is, is a good answer to um, censorship. And the reason I think that is because um, in many ways, I think, you know, blockchains and, and, and whatever, DAGs and, you know, they're essentially tech stacks, right? So you can, you can build what you want and many people can build what they want. Like it's the beauty of being open source and decentralized. And so, you know, I think without determining a certain position one way or another, I think that's, kind of why I personally love working at um, a foundation, which is our core mission is to empower builders, kind of whatever within reason, whatever they're, they're trying to build, right? And so I think for me, 
that's the beauty and that's why Web3 is a good answer to censorship is because it's so malleable, right? You can kind of build what you want on it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, Brady? Uh, yeah, I've got something to add to that too. Like to Elaine's point, it's really, it's, it is about enabling those builders. It's about getting them to be able to come up with <clears throat> new innovations in the space. And we talked about, you know, people throwing stuff against the wall. The latest thing that I've seen thrown against the wall when you talk about censorship resistance, you know, everyone says, oh, blockchain censorship resistance because I usher in this whole era of applications that anyone can do and say whatever they want. And um, there is a way of thinking about that that I think is really critical to understanding it. And it's not that the application is censorship resistant. And I think that's where we're missing the point. It's that there is a decoupling for the future state of applications of the application itself and the protocol. And when we talk about censorship resistance, the protocol is what is censorship resistant. So let's use an example of a, uh, of a social media protocol. Um, for frame of reference, it would be something that allows for uh, functionality similar to Twitter. At the protocol level, you would have your identity, you would have your data, and you would have publish and subscribe um, across all of these different identities and, and the data itself. And that is censorship resistant. You can pay in the cryptocurrency that's native to that protocol to create an identity. You, uh, as part of the protocol, have people who are subscribed to you as you know their identity is subscribed to your identity. You have the ability to publish things under your identity. And then you have um, uh, the ability to uh, keep that content tied to your identity. Beyond that and above it, in the architecture, there is an application. And the application is bare bones programming logic. And um, it's, it's uh, sort of a front end UI. It is um, the surfacing of the information that exists within the protocol. And it's sort of recommendation algorithms, everything that you would expect from like the front end um, or the functionality of like Twitter. As an end user, what you have is a bunch of different applications that are built on top of that protocol. So you've got maybe Twitter, you've got um, uh, Parler, Truth Social, whatever. And each of those applications allow users to log into the application using the identity that they have on their protocol and backfill all the information into that application. They keep their subscribers, they keep their content, they keep their identity and it all gets you know, brought into the application itself. And the application can then decide, hey, do we think that we want to surface the information from the protocol to users of our application? They can still make the decisions of censorship resistance. And if they decide to censor you, then as a, a, a identity and having all of your pub sub and having all of your content at the protocol layer, you can instead go to Parler. And let's say Parler is, not, you know, it's another application that exists on top of this protocol. And Parler says, hey, actually, you know, your, your racist uh, commentary and everything, we're fine with that. You can, you can log into your identity. We're going to allow that information to surface. And I, I think that framework and that architecture concept is sort of what we're going to see in the future of applications in Web3, and, and this one obviously specifically for just the uh, social media aspect, but I, I really like to think about it that way. Awesome. Thank you very much. Adam from Arculus, do you, uh, how do you think about yep. that? Sure, I'll, I'll agree with a lot of what uh, Brady was saying, right? Because at the end of the day, if I own my data, it's an easy to consume, you know, JSON payload or whatever, right? It's very easy for a generic front end to bring that in. And then, as you mentioned, their business policies will decide to censor or not. Uh, you know, if it's a platform that was censoring, I would quickly leave. And I think many other people would leave as well, but some people don't. And that's what makes a market. You know, at Arculus, we're all about consumer choice. So to the root of your question, do you think Web3 is the tool to prevent censorship? I think it's a strong weapon. 
But I think self-sovereign identity and that root ownership of identity, root ownership of content, uh, really is the is the strongest weapon because you own the content and you own the value. So you can then transport it from place to place in the business scenario or otherwise, whatever portion of your life, whether it be social media or finance, et cetera, you own everything. And then you can make the choices to interact with the businesses and platforms that you want that make the most sense. And to do that, you need to keep that content safe and secure, which is what we're trying to do. And you can pick your favorite protocol, whether that be HBAR, which is awesome, or you know, Ferris, which I'm just learning about, or other protocols, um, you, know, you can make that choice. So to me, the best weapon for against censorship is self-sovereignty and education, uh, self-education about who owns what and what you can do with your data and assets. Thousand percent, totally agreed. I think Yana um, had a step away just when I learned how to say "pretty awesome ventures." She has to go, so um, I'll I'll talk to her separately about this. But um, Sal from Seal Storage, yeah, sure, happy to jump in here. And so, you know, um, I don't think we're going to solve the debate in this call with regards to you know censorship, but we, you know, from the perspective of you know Filecoin as a storage system, uh, if you look at their their mission statement, is to preserve humankind's most important information. Uh, so when we look at centralized providers today that provide storage, you know, they could be coerced into, you know, deleting files or withholding services based upon, you know, political environments, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we see it as, as an advantage uh, today. You know, for example, uh, we work with Starling Labs and, you know, com- combating misinformation and preserving history is key, right? So they have information such as, you know, human rights violations, war crimes, testimonies to the genocide, all right? So preserving their digital provenance is, provenance is, is extremely important. Uh, and we feel, you know, a decentralized type ecosystem is what best served for, you know, for sharing that information in a sense, right? So... Um, you know, again, I, I don't, you know, there, there's, there's certainly, you know, arguments on both sides. You know, one, one of the, the things about Filecoin as an ecosystem is they have a governance team as well. So data that's brought on board is checked by the community to ensure that it's verifiable. It's, it's data that's it's important, right, to the, you know, to the, to, to the globe, you know, users. And um, yeah, so um, we, we see it as a, as a good thing. Right from a from a decentralized standpoint, and uh, and again, you know, a central provider could be, you know, could delete files or withhold services. So we certainly see it as an advantage. And you know, I just I just want to quickly talk to just just one last thing. You know, the yeah, sure. topic of this is marketing buzz or tech revolution. I mean, you know, today on on the ecosystem, you know, we've got real world use cases. You know, I mentioned a few establishments establishments we're working with. So there's real utility. There's real storage going on to to block chain decentralized storage today. Uh, I believe the ecosystem is somewhere around 18 exabytes of data today on the on the Web3 decentralized storage. So it's certainly proving it's, it's worth. Uh, it is certainly early adoption and we're working with customers you know working with seal storage to uh to develop apis uh, much like pinata does but uh, you know i just wanted to sort of uh, just touch upon that yes we see it as a tech revolution as opposed to just buzz thank you nope oh, absolutely um michael from veris yeah um so i'll just uh speak about this a little bit because so when I, in the late 2000s, I was CEO for a social networking company that I sold to Microsoft. Web Fives was the company. And, you know, this has been from the beginning and in our vision paper that we wrote, uh, I guess it's been now about four and a half years ago, and we've now far exceeded whatever we wrote we were going to do. The whole goal was a public commons where humans had new tools to be able to interact, communicate, and exchange in commerce with each other in a decentralized way. And so uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, I posted up what I believe is also the first self-sovereign permanent online social networking profile. Now, it was a, like an example. You can see it at verisio slash verisid lookup slash Mike. And that actually what it's doing is it's reading permanent data, no host. I don't pay anything for that. I don't 
It's not a service. It's just my my self sovereign ID proving that I actually own other accounts. It looks like the my LinkedIn account. I need to go and and redo something on LinkedIn. But aside from that, it proves that I own other accounts. It's permanent. I cannot be deplatformed. I cannot have someone remove it from the internet. As far as I know, this is actually the data stored in this one in our weave. And as far as I know, um, that's going to be around, you know, they claim for, I mean, it's decentralized enough to believe that it's going to be around for as long as, as people keep data. And so um, this is basically a permanent censorship proof can't be taken down by a company or a country example proof an actual uh, profile that is what we're talking about so I think the answer is yes you can do that um, and and then the the challenge really is um, oh and then actually this is one of those cases where I actually think I agree with everyone what they've said uh, and and Brady mentioned, you know, a perfect general architecture for how this public commons should work, which is you have an ID and you publish in your ID. So we have IDs that you can publish data, permanent data through your ID quite easily with a command, no programming or an RPC call from an app. And you publish into your ID. You can publish like a tweet or you can publish these things, and you can query all the IDs that you care about. So you can subscribe to any IDs to see what they're publishing. And these can be across any number of blockchains for scale. And so you basically have in the protocol exactly what Brady described, this pub-sub um, way of publishing information of any size, any kind of content that is absolutely just permanent self-sovereign. And I think of that as human archaeology. And that's why it is it needs to be censorship resistant, you know, we're born with the ability to scratch a drawing into the sand or on a wall. And we could also now have digital ability to put our digital mark on the world because it's part of being alive. And so we actually enable this protocol that is permanent. It exists right now on Verus and it will on mainnet soon exist on an unlimited number of connected chains. And the way that it works is you can, um, publish, you can subscribe, you can, it's all permanent, you can, but the applications, and we have ratings, we have this ability to publish ratings, and we have this ability to have um, lists that you can publish that other people could, um, you know, query about the currencies that you might trust, or different ratings that you have on those currencies, or people that you might trust, or different ratings that you have, and it's exactly what Brady said, the applications, whether they are, you know, one of the existing social networking applications or others, can look at your profile and your data. And, you know, if you and if you have some semi-private things that you have made private, you can provide viewing keys so they can see your private data and they, you know, and they can decide based on their standards how to ex what should be exposed, what shouldn't, if there's any violation of anything that, you know, whatever it happens to be, it, this is an application level thing. And the reason that this was, in fact, that, that one of the main reasons that I felt we needed to make Verus was I was working in machine learning. I was a consultant and I was building systems that would sort email uh, into automated, you know, smart categories of your usage by reading them, but not in a way that would violate your privacy. Like read them, categorize them learn from what it's doing. And I realized that if we would just make human information available, that we would actually have a hope of having AIs that, that better understood how to actually benefit humanity because it would be all of humanity making information available rather than um, a small number of very kind of profit-focused groups of people who are actually exploiting the rest of the information. This is something we really need to do. So I do believe that what we're talking about, the Internet of Value or Web3 as part of it, is an answer that we need as humans to censorship resistance. And I also believe in the fact that we will end up creating communities, digital communities, large and small, that have their own standards of what kinds of content 
out of the sea of human existence and archaeology, you know, what's happening, we can't say that we have control over that. What we can do is say that we have standards and, and interest in, in consuming certain kinds of information or interacting with certain groups and communities. That's how I think of it. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, Kelly Kim, who still has, I think, my favorite title of, uh, that I've ever had as a guest, um, the develop, developer evangelist. Um, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Michael. I often refer to myself as the uh, technical cheerleader, which is a, a more uh, lighthearted uh, alternative to that. But I'll, I'll make my answer short. Um, I'm going to say an abounding yes, Web3 is a solution to censorship. I feel like this question was kind of made for Pinata because, you know, at Pinata, we, we enable this freedom at an infrastructure level by making IPFS easy, fast, and secure. You know, that's our job. We help builders, developers, and creators to... Uh, upload, share, distribute, and yeah, like ultimately own their content. You manage your brand, you protect your data, you manage where your data and content goes. Um, and that's whether you're a non-technical creator or a highly technical developer, you know, you can come to the Pinata web app or you can grab our API and do exactly as you wish. Um, we're also blockchain agnostic, so you won't be chain constrained. Um, I, I kind of want to like touch on censorship itself. I think we should always learn from history and everything that came before us has a reason. So, you know, why does the censorship exist in the first place? And, and what happens to malicious content that the internet is currently attacking? You know, what do we do about that? So I, I mentioned Pinata does this, um, will freeze the web from censorship as an infrastructural level. I think that Web3 on kind of an ideological and um, community level rewards vibrant communities or, um, yeah, just communities that provide a net positive to the world. So we're not just leaving this world without uh, protection from uh, malicious agents or ideas. You know, we're actually creating something that is a hedge against that and at the same time providing a solution to uh, for people to own their data and uh, preserve freedom of speech. So that's me. Okay, Kelly, I have a question on that. In terms of the protocol, like decentralized storage is an interesting one because there's a lot of opportunity for infringement legally and then uh, also opportunity for uh, malicious content and you can expand on that sort of in your head what types of stuff that would be but um, what what happens when someone does upload files for example to a protocol I, I believe it is it Filecoin that the pinata uses for storage or is it its own network so we have our own nodes on IPFS, and um, okay. yeah. So, so okay. So for you, so you would be able to decide then with those nodes what is being what is allowed to be stored, and you could deprecate it. But the rest of the network, they can make their own decisions on that. So it does exist and continue to persist in some way. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. Excellent. Um, uh, the time just flies by when we're having great conversations. And I really want to just thank everybody. I'd like to thank our great host, John Ricker. He is the man and he's been uh, the host this entire time up here under the, you might see him under the coin telegraph logo. Um, so thank you, John, for putting this together and getting all the guests together. Um, I really appreciate that. And I want to thank everyone who was listening to this Twitter space very sincerely. I hope that you have found. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I hope that you have found this discussion to be informative. A big special thanks goes to John, of course. And on behalf of the Cointelegraph Research Team, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for our guest speakers for giving their time to participate in today's event. So thank you very much. And I just want to give one more outro to everybody. The, uh, the official research partners were Project 12, Veris, Exco, Pinata, 
uh, pretty awesome ventures, sub, sub, Arculus, CoinShift, Seal Storage, and Hedera, of course. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you guys or, you know, virtually see you guys on the next Twitter space that we have on the next report. So thank you very much, and make sure you check out all of our partners. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.